Okay then, hi everyone. Great to see that many people. We actually have more than 50 participants for this final version, this final brown bag uh, lunch for, for this spring season. And today we will learn how to focus more and be more efficient, I guess. And for that, I would like to introduce my friend, Stefan Nettebay, that will do this talk about monotasking. Please introduce yourself and start your presentation. Yes, I, I, I should share my screen as well. Can uh, you see it now? Yes. Yes. So uh, before I introduce myself, uh, we should do a Stroop test. And as you knew in the Stroop test, uh, there's something written on the screen and you should yell or scream or say the color of what is written. So you shouldn't read what is written. You should say the color of what is written. So it's, if it's written in, in blue, you scream blue. So uh, all of you, could you please turn on your microphones? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So th this test, uh, the Stroop test was created by John Ridley Stroop in 1935. So it's an, it's an old, old test. Uh, so are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so if it's written in green, for example, you, you are in your screen green, okay? So let's start now. Green, 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 red, 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 blue, 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 red, red, red. green, green. 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 <laughs> Blue, blue, blue. Blue. <laughs> okay, so that, that, that was easy. Now, the second test is created by this lady. She's called Joanne Cantor, and it's built upon, it draws on, on the Stroop test. And it's the same rules. You should yell the color, not what you read. Okay, so are you ready? Anyone ready? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Red, blue, green, red, green, green, red, blue, green, blue, red. Okay. Did you read the, the sentence there? Did anyone read that? Uh, we won't uh, remember uh, much of it. No. <laughs> I don't think you'll remember much of this. <laughs> so th this these kind of things are what people usually think about when, when they talk about monotasking or multitasking, that it's very hard to put attention to to, to put attention to two things at the same time. Yeah, in this this book, the monotasking book, which actually has its official release date today, even though I've seen people unboxing it on the internet already. Yeah, I I try to find uh, more than just, just, just the focus. What, what is it that makes good monotasking? I think it's, it's things that uh, you could prepare before uh, and things happening around this. And so, so I found like six areas. Uh, and these are six chapters, like cut down on tasks, tasks to do, uh, focus on one task now. That's what we did, need, did now. Uh, never procrastinate, progress, incrementally simplify cooperation and recharge creative thinking. So this, I, I, my thesis is that these, all these six areas, they might overlap and there might be other areas as well, but these six areas contribute to uh, your ability to focus on what you want to focus, what you have decided to focus on. And today we will talk about, or I will talk about two of these. This is a short, short introduction, of course, only 30 minutes. Cut down on tasks to do and then procrastinate. So I'll give, give some examples. But let's start with a story about airplanes. So this, does anyone recognize this man? Warren Buffett? It's Warren Buffett. So who's Warren Buffett? He's like one of, is a legendary investor, one of the, the richest men on earth uh, or something like that. And since he's such, so rich, of course, he has his own airplane and his own pilot. And he had a pilot called Mike Flint. And one day he said to Mike, uh, Mike, can you uh, write down your top 25 career goals? So Mike went home, made the list of his top 25 career goals and, and came back to, to Warren and said, here is my list. And Warren said, 
Well, now, Mike, can you circle the five most important out of these 25? This was very hard for Mike, but he managed to do this to, to pick five career goals out of these 25 career goals that he was aiming for. And went back to Warren, and then Warren said, yeah, what about these that you didn't circle, the other 20? And Mike said, like, well, the top five are my primary focus, but the other 20 came in a close second. So uh, they're still important. Um, I will work on these intermittently as I see fit. They are not urgent, but I still plan to give them dedicated effort. And that's when, when Warren Buffett said, no, you got it all wrong, Mike. Everything you did in circle just became your avoid at all cost list. In Swedish, I would say, uh, undvik till varje pris lista. Avoid at all cost list. All these 20. So no matter what, no matter what, these things get no attention from you until you succeeded with the top five. That, that's what Warren Buffett said. And five out of 25, that's like 20%, or that's exactly 20%. There's nothing magic about 20%, but we can think about 20% because you probably recognize this picture of a small weight, which says 20, that outweighs a big weight, which says 80. What do you usually call this? Pareto principle. The Pareto principle, or there's another name as well, the 80-20 principle or something like that, or the 80-20 rule, or the Pareto principle. The Wilfred, Wilfred Pareto was an Italian economist, lived uh, 100 years ago, a little, little more than 100 years ago. And he discovered that 20% um, of the people in England owned 80% of the wealth. And then uh, some management consultant 50 years later or something at General Motors coined this uh, term, the, the Pareto principle. Um, but, but the idea here is that there are a few things, a minority of the causes that create the majority of the impact. A minority of the causes create a majority of the impact. So if we only can put our fingers on the most important thing, we will get almost all the, the, the impact without having to do so much. It doesn't, I mean, this 80 20 doesn't have to sum up to, to 100. You could say like 90 15 or something like that. The, the idea is that the majority and the minority, the minority of causes and the majority of, of impact. So if we, can, if we could complete the top five tasks, let's say that we had 25 tasks on, on a backlog or on, on our to do list. And if we could complete the, the, the top five tasks and save 20, uh, then, then we might have uh, yeah, get almost the same impact as if we have done all the 20, 25. So the problem is really, can we choose to do all the tasks that create value? Can we really do that? Probably not, because even if we do these five and save the other 20 for tomorrow, then we will probably have at least five new tasks that is more important than those 20. So these new five, will most likely be more important than the saved 20. So why do we then keep this task, which we obviously won't do? Why do we keep these other 20 that we won't do? They create value. They are like, uh, they're useful many, but they are not a vital few. Well, one reason is what we call time inconsistency. So time inconsistency, that is like, yeah, uh, I think that right now I'm unusually busy, but within two weeks, I will have a lot of time. So I say yes to your suggestion. Someone comes to me and say, can you do this? Hey, Stefan, can you do this? And I say, well, I, uh, my, my calendar is very busy now, but I see that I have a lot of time two weeks from now. Uh, so I say yes to this. Then when two weeks have passed, it's exactly the same situation. Right now, I'm very busy, but in two weeks' time, I have more time. And there's actually a lot of research that uh, supports this. So, for example, uh, people who visit a, um, 
uh, visit the city for only one day or something like that, they see more landmarks than people who stay in a city for one year. That's because they feel that, that when, when you stay there for one year, you think I will have more time later on. Uh, so I do need to do this today. And also in another, another study, uh, people got gift certificates to, to uh, a cake in a, like a French pastry cafe. So cafe. So uh, yeah, they, they got a voucher for a cake and if they went there, they would get it. And then some vouchers, it says you have to, this has expired date of three weeks. And some, it said you have expired, it's an expired date of three months. When they gave out these vouchers, they asked people how committed they were to you to um, re redeem these uh, vouchers. And uh, the people that had three months were more committed. But in reality, five, it was five times as likely for those that had a close expired date to redeem these uh, uh, vouchers. Uh, because they, they felt that they, were, they, they had to do it now or not do it. So time, exist time inconsistency, it makes us accept too many tasks on a to-do list because we think that we can do them later. Yeah, so if we collect all these things, uh, why don't we drop them then? The, if we know that we won't do them, what, why even keep these things uh, that we won't do? Well, one reason is something that this young lady discovered. She's called Bluma Sagarnik, or was called. She lived like 100 years ago in the 1920s in Berlin in Germany. And she was a researcher, psychology researcher. And when she went to, went to the, the coffee shops, the, the, the cafes in Berlin with her friends, they sat there and discussed things and they ordered cake and uh, maybe tea. And they sat and discussed. I mean, there were psychology researchers that had a lot to, to discuss the, the latest uh, new discoveries. And uh, then they, they ordered more and discussed more and ordered more and could sit there for hours. And then they called for the waiter. And when the waiter came, they said, can we pay? And it was very strange because the waiter always knew exactly what they have ordered, even though the waiter didn't take any notes. And that was a bit provocative for a, for a little gang of uh, psychology researchers. So one day they did an experiment. They sat there, ordered things, discussed, ordered things, discussed, uh, called for the waiter, paid the, the bill, which was co absolutely correct. Then they stayed there for half an hour. And then they, they called for the waiter again and said, Hey, waiter, do you still remember what we ordered, what we paid for half an hour ago? What do you think the waiter said? No. 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 I can't recall what you ordered since you have already paid the bill. So there's something, this was, was very interesting. Uh, Bluma thought this was really interesting. There's something about our memory when we feel that task is done or when we have dropped it. It doesn't stay there, but as long as it's half, half done, uh, it still interrupts us. But it's still there somewhere in the brain and will interrupt, interrupt us. So the question was, was, because this was a very small sample, just one waiter, could she replicate this in a scientific experiment? And she did. And she found out that unfinished tasks are remembered twice as well as completed ones. So the things that you haven't, haven't uh, uh, completed will be remembered twice as twice as many of these as the completed ones. So the experiment was like this. She had like 160 people, something like that. And they got 20 tasks. And the tasks was like uh, make a box of cardboards or make clay figures or uh, solve some puzzles or some arithmetics or, or things like that. And what they didn't know, but was a part of the experiment, but that while they were doing some of these tasks, Bluma came in and said, uh, see, you're working with number five, but you can stop that now and go on and start with number six. 
So they were interrupted in 10 out of these 20 tasks. And then after, after this experiment, they had to wait a little, little time. And then, then Bluma said, can you write down a list now of all, all these 20 tasks? And of course they didn't rem remember all of them, in particular, those that they had completed. So they remembered twice as many of those that they didn't have completed as uh, compared to those that they had completed. And this is usually called the Sigarnik effect after this Blumas Sigarnik. I call it waiter effect. This is easier to remember, the waiter effect. Application of this is in cliffhangers in TV series. There's a deliberate use of the waiter effect or the, the, the Sigarnik effect. You know, where the, where the hero is about to die or something, hanging from a cliff, someone is trying to shoot the hero and you don't know what will happen. This becomes a task in your head. You want to complete this. Uh, so you immediately go to the next episode and start that one because you, you feel that you haven't completed it. So you can think of it as a model here that I created uh, where uh, the pink part of this smileys or these heads is how much uh, space does this task occupy in your head? So first, if you start from left, you're not aware of a task. Then you're aware of the usefulness of the task. Maybe you're working from home. You go out to the kitchen, see a lot of dirty dish there. And you think, maybe I should do the dishes. But you haven't started yet. So it's starting to occupy some, some part of your head. Then you decide, may, maybe I should start now. I will start. I will probably start now with the dishes. It occupies a little bit more. And then you have started with it. You start doing the dishes. Even if you leave there, it will occupy a lot of, of your head because you have started with this. So you will be interrupted. If you start solving some arithmetic problems or programming or something, you will be reminded that you have started the dishes and you haven't finished it until you drop this uh, thing the, to do the dishes, the idea that you will do the dishes. Either it could be because you're done with it, you have, you have already, everything is clean, or that you decide that you won't do it. Maybe you think that, well, this was the kids that created this in the first place, all this mess, so they have to solve this when they come home. Then it might disappear, or at least won't uh, take as much, much uh, space. So this also this uh, pink part also creates some kind of, of um, commitment, and this was proved in experiment. Um, if you see the beige bars there, the brown bars, it says six goals and one goals, and said, and then the the y-axis or the vertical axis says commitment gain. So uh, it was lit, people were a little bit committed with more committed with six goals and one goals. So what does this mean? The, the experiment was like this. Every day during a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, 60 people or, or 70 people came to a site and they got some um, tasks. And the task was today, things like today, you're going to read the book for pleasure, or today you're going to eat an especially healthy meal, or today you're going to call someone you haven't had a chance to call, or today you're going to organize or tidy up, or something a little bit positive, the things that you want to do. And then they tested how committed they were to do this. And actually, these that uh, some, half of these people got one, one of these tasks, and half of these people got six tasks. And the one that got six tasks were a little bit more committed. But then they changed the experiment. So the next week, half the group got one task and half got six tasks. But then they were also asked to make some kind of implementation plan. So if, for example, if I said, read the book for pleasure, they asked like, what book will you read? And you have, you have to write down what book you, you, you would read or eat an especially healthy meal. What healthy meal will you, will you eat? Or call someone I haven't had the chance to call. What, what person will you call? Then everything turned around. So if you see the blue bars there, the people that got one go 
were far more committed when they have thought about how to implement this. And the people that got six tasks, they were not committed at all when they had to, to make plans or implementation plans for, for uh, uh, how they would do these six tasks. So it, it seems now like we have a strong case for something. Uh, first, there would never be enough time. We can always, there's some kind of bug in our brain that, that uh, makes it possible for us to always come up with more valuable things than we could ever do. So we have to choose. We cannot choose between good and bad tasks. We have to choose between most valuable and less valuable or vital and useful. So there would be more, more, never be enough time. And the second thing is some tasks are more important since a minority of causes creates a majority of the impact. And then everything that is started demands attention. And finally, single goal, goal, single goal commitment is stronger. If you have one goal and you have thought about how, what you should do, you will be more committed than if you have six goals, six competing goals in your head. So it seems here that this is not about while doing things. This is only about planning. This is about our backlog or to-do list. It seems like if we have a too long to-do list, we will do less, we will, or our priority will be blurred, or commitment will be bad, and we might do the wrong things. So the question then is, how can we cut down on tasks to do? How can we cut down on tasks to do? How can we remove those useful many and only save those vital few? So here are three different ways to do it. The first one is the to-do list. And this is what people usually have. So they have like a long, long to-do list and it's spread out across multiple medias. You have something in your uh, inbox, in your mail client. Maybe you have some uh, to-do list on your refrigerator. And then you have some to-do list in the cloud and then you have written something in, uh, in the office, some, some post-its, and yeah, yeah, this to-do list is long and it's not prioritized at all. It's just a long list of things. It's very hard to get some priority. It's very blur, blur priority. And you will start with things here and there and, and all over without any strategy. Another thing that sometimes people try is to put, put the priorities or the to-do list in the calendar. So they decide like, Tuesday after lunch, I will do this. Wednesday before lunch, I will do that. Has anyone tried this? Usually there are a few who try this and I always ask them, did it work or not? And they say, well, in the beginning it worked, but then uh, as soon as some, something took a long time, then I thought about the whole schedule was crashed because uh, the calendar doesn't work with this. So, so uh, only if you have predictable things, you know exactly how long time it will take, you, you can use this. So the idea in a monotasking book is to make a short list instead. So every morning you take a pen and, pen and a paper, for example, or some other media, and you write down maximum five tasks. And these tasks should be small and actionable. And sm small, I mean, uh, something between 10 minutes and 10, two hours or something like that. So you write down the shortlist. You don't take yesterday's shortlist and just continue with it. You write a new shortlist and then you choose one and start with that one. And during the day, this is not the plan that you will com complete all these five during the days. It's just the, the five most important things that you can do right now here where you're sitting at the desktop, not things that you can do somewhere else. And during the day, when you might cross, cross off things, not uh, remove things, you might add other things. But if you ha already have five things and you want to add something because you come up with something or some, someone reminds you of something, you have to trade away something else. So never more than five here in this list. An important thing here is that priority 
is what you do. It's not what you plan. So if you if you make a long plan of things, you will probably not do all these things, and it's not a priority. It's it's just a plan, just a list of long long list of things. So here, the short list will have a good chance to really be implemented because it's these things that you have chosen, just a few things. Then the, it is these things that if you have decided to do something, will you really do it? And then we come to, to the other part here, the procrastination part. So what, what does procrastination mean? Does anyone have a good uh, definition? Putting things off instead of doing them right now. Instead of doing them right now. So like you have decided to do something, you have decided to do task A, but you're not doing it, you're doing something else. The act of putting off, especially something requiring, requiring immediate attention. Uh, so, I mean, th this is really waste. When we've decided to do something, but we still do something else, we're probably not doing the most important things. We're just escaping to some kind of meaningless trivia. So the first thing here of overcoming this, the first step of overcoming this is to understand the nature of procrastination. You decided what to start with, but before you stop. So here is a list, not a complete list, but the list of some, some things that might be excuses for procrastinations. I think my favorites, two favorites are, uh, you're afraid that the result will not be good enough. So if you don't do anything, people won't criticize you. So you procrastinate. And the other one is, you're afraid that you will do this too good. The result will be too good. So if you do this, people ask you to do it again and again, and you don't want that. But it could be many reasons for, for procrastination. One thing to understand when, when we talk about procrastination is something I call brain economy. We have to understand the brain economy. Maybe you recognize it that you come to work, you come to office, and you know exactly what to do. You decided it yesterday. But before you start, you go and get a cup of coffee. Then you come back to your desk and think, now I will start with this important task. But first, I need to check the news on the web. You start reading the news, and then uh, you get a little bored after a while, and you skip that and go to Facebook instead. And you say, wow, my cousin had porridge for uh, breakfast. And then you see a picture of uh, Angelina Jolie. And you think like, hmm, what was the name of Angelina Jolie's third husband? And you have to check that. You have to make some important research here, checking in IMDB or somewhere to, to find out that. And you continue this important research forgetting about the task that you should, should have done, that you have decided to done, and suddenly it's lunch. You go, on, you go to lunch, eat, and think that I will, I will continue with this when I come back. And when you come back after lunch, you feel like, mm, I'm too tired now. I can't do this task. I will do it tomorrow. Has anyone seen this? Maybe you have some friend or someone that has experienced something similar. Matthias, have you heard of this? Nothing. Well, yeah, I true. Many have had it. They always go on. Sorry, English. Uh, I know people joke about uh, looking at YouTube. They start, they, they, they go to do something, and then suddenly they find themselves looking at some strange YouTube clip, and they have no idea how they got there. I think we've all been there. We've all been there. So, uh, but we have this part of a brain in the front, which is called prefrontal cortex, which is very different from most other animals, uh, the, brain, the brains of other, many other animals. That's the part where we can imagine things. And that's the part where we make priorities because we can imagine that if we do this, this will happen and this will happen. The, the problem with this, this part is that it's only 5% of the size, but it demands 25% of the energy of the brain. I have most of this energy, most good calls in the morning. So if you don't start to prioritize in the morning, if you don't start with the right task, 
uh, it will be harder and harder as long as the day goes to start with that one. So if we could kickstart the day, if we could start with the most important thing from the beginning, maybe we won't uh, procrastinate. So how can we get started in the morning? Well, this lady, Maria Rikersov-Siankina, uh, she was a friend of Bloma Saigarnik that I talked about before, about the, you know, the cliffhanger, the waiter effect. Actually, she worked at the same in institute as uh, Bloma Saigarnik, and she built on her experiment. What she found out, this is a, a slide in German, maybe Enno uh, like this one. But I think it says, and you have to, to correct me if I'm wrong now, uh, that people that was uh, interrupted were very keen to continue with what they were doing before they were interrupted. Is that correct, Anna? Yeah, that's totally correct. Yeah. So we li we like to complete or task. Uh, we like to complete tasks that we, that we have done. So what what we could think of here is that. Before we go, well, I should, I should explain the experiment first. This is the last part of this talk, actually. Before, before I give you this advice, I, I will explain the, uh, how, how she find, find out this. Uh, she had an experiment with a lot of people, and they had small tasks like folding a paper hat or translating it, uh, text from German to French. And in the middle of this, they were, interrupt, they were abruptly interrupted someone came into the room and dropped a lot of things like uh, needles or nails or something on, on the floor. And uh, then that, that person said, hey, can you help me pick this up? And these kind of people that were part of this experiment, they uh, put this, uh, away these half uh, folded hats and helped that person. And when they were done with that, Maria entered the room and said, hey, the experiment is over. You can go and sit there in the sofa and I will, give, I will ask you some questions. And then she asked, her, asked these people some questions and then she said, now you can go home. But they didn't, they didn't go home. What do you think they did? They finished the first task. They, first, they finished the first task, they went back to the half folded hats and completed them. So there's a strong will to complete things that you have started. And what you can think about that now, when you work in an office or even if you work at home, this, usually you think in the afternoon that I will complete this task and then I will go home. But instead you should think I will start something and then I will go home, not finishing it. And in the next morning, you will be very keen to start with that one again, because you feel that you're half, you, you, yeah, it's half done, this thing. It, since many of you are programs, you can think of this that you, you write a test and it's read. And then in the morning, you will be very keen to make it green. So going home in the middle of the task instead of going home after the task uh, is completed. I call this self self-fulfilling task. There should be a strong willingness to resume the original task. So the summary here is the short list, the five most important tasks right now. You write it in the morning. You don't take yesterday's list. You write a new list, five things that you can complete right here that is important today, not in two weeks or something like that. And the other thing, the self-fulfilling task, go home or stop working in the afternoon in the middle of a task. And that, that was everything in the, the speech part of this. And as I said, the book, this one, is actually um, released, released, officially released today. And there's also another book, Pomodoro Technique Illustrated, but it's like 10 years old now, it, but still popular. So now I think we open up for reflections or questions. Uh, great. Then I will I will stop the recording then. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you.